Well, first of all, how are you doing? <laughs> Hanging in there, how are you? Good. Welcome, everybody. Um, so, Nathan, um, one thing I asked Mina in the last one that I want to ask you is, um, I already asked you how you're doing, but also, like, what are you, like, learning about this experience, maybe about yourself or just about anything, life in general? <laughs> I assume you're talking about the pandemic and not yeah. about design systems. Yeah, right now we're just talking about that. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, I think our family, and particularly my wife and I, have learned that we plan too many activities and uh, it's we're trying to find the blessing in what's happening with just spending time together and not being so busy all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we feel really fortunate that we've been able to shelter in place together and, and do things that, and, and be together in ways that we haven't been before. So that's been really nice, actually. I've been working from home for 14 years, so it's that hasn't been a, as big an adjustment for me, but it's been, um, interesting to be on that journey with lots of other people I collaborate with that are doing it for the first time. Yeah, so like Eight Shapes has pretty much been distributed the whole time, right? Yeah, when we opened, uh, my partner Dan and I in 2006, uh, he lives in Maryland, I live in Virginia, and we've been remote first ever since. We've had a, an optional co-working space that we have uh, at least for a couple of years, but that just faded because people didn't use it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so we have a question already from Jeff, and um, don't be shy, get your questions to everybody. Um, so Jeff asks, what design systems are you seeing built using web components? <laughs> uh, well, my company is currently working on one that's uh, in-house at a large financial company that uh, we're really excited about. Uh, it serves a predominantly Angular ecosystem and so that's been an interesting ride to uh, provide that flexibility that Web Components provides, but still fine tune it with sort of rich add-ons so that data binding and other things work really well with the environment that most of our customers use. Mm -hmm. I also was a part of Morningstar uh, design system from 2017 to 18. And in mid-year in 18, we made a decision to go Web Components and spent like they spent, I, I sort of rolled off, uh, they spent about a year transforming. And it was interesting that in the period when we made the decision, it was a very diverse ecosystem of frameworks, Angular, Vue, React, uh, you know, Adobe's CMS product, you know, all these different places. And then during the process of converting the web components to serve all, they naturally, without an architectural edict, went Vue. And so that's why people now, like even yesterday on Twitter, will ask me, I thought Morningstar was going web components, now they're view, why? And it's because that's where their customers went. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been an interesting ride. But Kevin at, at my company in particular, he's a principal UI developer, and uh, he concentrates a lot on the open sort of web components evolution and what's going on, on out there. And we're still really bullish about the problems that still need to be solved, like accessibility and other things that are going to lead to a future where they're, they're more prominent. Yeah, I have admittedly not had the opportunity to explore web components yet, but that talk Stephanie and Brandon did at Clarity really, like, like I learned a lot from that talk. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it, it was, all the models that, that that talk had around just design systems and yeah. how to name tokens, which I think you and I recently chatted about, and, and a, a few other things, just like almost overshadowed the fact that they are solving hard problems with web components. They're dealing with the light DOM and the shadow DOM and, and the relationship of styles that are encapsulated or not. Yeah. And for a framework of that kind of scale of use, mm -hmm. you have to really be very mindful and careful about all of the details. Yeah. So encouraging to see them dive in. I'll send the link to that slide deck to everybody so you, um, in case you haven't seen the talk. Um, I also have the footage. I just still haven't gotten that edited yet. <laughs> Um, cool. So we have a question from Todd. Uh, what type of system would you say best fits a smaller company and why? A strict system or a loose system? Ooh, that's an interesting continuum to put the question on, strict versus loose. Yeah. I would suspect that the if you really started to constrain the number of customers of a system, or even like Mina last week was talking about, mm -hmm. her systems for themselves, they don't really serve other people, but... I do sometimes consult with uh, smaller orgs that are having a system created by a team that might not be dedicated, et cetera. But 
there aren't that many other adopting squads to it. And so some things that, that come to mind are they can include more specific things that aren't as broadly reusable. Mm -hmm. um, and so if they're like a marketing, predominantly a marketing ecosystem with a little bit of account management in the background, I'd be more de uh, apt to say, okay, start putting some reusable marketing components in there, which isn't really how you deal with a system used by hundreds of teams. Right. Another thing that comes to mind is I might be tempted to be more strict because you have a narrower group that you really need to align with. And that gives you an opportunity to make narrower decisions. And mm -hmm. as a result, be more well-defined and more opinionated in the things that you build into your systems components and other features. The last thing I would say is I think about the outputs that the team uses. I would be probably looser with the management of things like sketch assets, mm -hmm. even though I'd be a lot sort of more apathetic to documentation in general, because the, the smaller group that you have, uh, the greater opportunity you have to share a lot of that knowledge through collaboration and, and through the relationships that you have, mm -hmm. rather than like if you're serving hundreds of different product squads, that documentation site is the source of truth and you have to really concentrate on heavily documenting. Yeah, I find like if it's a very small team, especially if it's a team of me, <laughs> Um, I'm usually not spending any time at all on making any sketch libraries. Uh, you know, that's something I only take into um, account, like if there's a large team of other designers that need it. Yeah, I've even seen like uh, at one company I worked with uh, that was an e-commerce experience. They had different groups, think of like five squads working on the top of the funnel pages. They had five squads working on checkout, five squads working on their registry product, et cetera. And it was interesting to see that they created a sketch environment that had a fairly tightly managed core, mm -hmm. but then that same tooling enabled the people working on the core and each of those groups of five squads, which might be seven to 10 designers, to actually be really fast and loose and sort of that other sort of second tier of stuff. And so even when you talk about strictness, you have to talk about the nature of the relationships involved and that not every component is equal in terms of need for strictness. Yeah. Um, so Jen asks, our design system is starting to pivot from pure SCSS to delivering, and in parentheses she has view, uh, components. Any particular words of wisdom to anticipate challenges we might encounter in that transition? Well, that transition is definitely happening for a lot of teams. Mm -hmm. um, and what I recall from four to five years ago, like when Clarity was starting and so on, it was build me a bootstrap for our team was essentially yeah. the mindset that people had. And that's a markup and style based library. And mm -hmm. over the past four years, as these frameworks of React, Vue, Angular have really emerged, um, they create opportunities that maybe you persist in supporting markup and style and you build it into the framework or you transition to only offer it through the framework. Right. And so that's one big question that teams have. Once you get into the framework, I think the conversations become most useful in talking about um, the encapsulation of style within a component. So how are you going to create things like namespaces or literal sort of styled components in a React library that take all the style and only deliver it so it impacts what the component is. Hmm. Another conversation that comes into play is how do you deal with the rest of the styles that are on a page? and insulate the components that you're dropping from the library, from all the other stuff, particularly on things like the HTML and the body tag, so that you're insulated from that. We use a term called hostile styles at HShapes, and when we test our components, we actually inject horrifically gross styles, like 67 point orange underlined shadowed text that's all caps. Mm -hmm. And we inject that onto certain elements so that we can see if the component's actually resilient within that hostile territory. And so that's another thing that, that we think about is the relationship, the boundary like that. The last thing is really how you think about um, how you tool up the decisions you make. You know, SAS offers not just variables which seem like an analog to tokens, but they mm -hmm. also offer a sort of that a next layer of mix-ins and other kind of functions, modules, yeah. whatever where you can really wrap in a lot of logic and loop over values or, or what have you. And I see the teams that are building a React, I'll drop into a team and they'll be struggling with that because they won't have that logic. And I'm like, okay, where do you have that kind of intelligence? 
I don't know, we just hard code by component. And I'm like, not good enough, at least for me. I'd like to see that dry up a little bit in the code base. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm still a big time SAS person here. And I, obviously I'm speaking from my own personal experience, but I just find SAS to be very designer friendly, especially designers who are already comfortable with CSS, because it basically still feels like writing CSS. You just get extra magic. Um, I, I try to be, you know, open to writing things like in React or Vue or um, at Amazon, they were doing JSS. And um, in both situations at Amazon and at Salesforce, we were writing SaaS for the design team, but then the engineers would take that and change it into whatever it was that they were doing. Um, so I, I, I find that interesting because I'm working on a, a website right now with Kaleg. Actually, it's the Design Tokens Community Group website. And it's using, um, what do they call it? Uh, modules, CSS modules. And you can still write SAS in it, but it's still just a very different way of thinking because of, like you said, it's all encapsulated into that component. And so for me, it's like, I gotta like rewire my brain a little bit. <laughs> well, I think that's, that's an interesting challenge though, that to me, if the team of developers and designers working together have a growth mindset and are open mm -hmm. to collaboration, I will immediately try to create the gateway drug of tokens, but then start to expand that to CSS. Right. Where are the spots in the code where uh, we can all be comfortable working together? How do we sort of isolate the work and know where to target those rules and what the sort of code style guide is of those rules, such that someone like you can still come into a otherwise React JS hostile space and know where your stuff goes right. and be able to understand what's the structure I'm trying to mark up and those kinds of things. And it can be a challenge if, if the, for example, the developers aren't really accommodating or welcoming mm -hmm. uh, into that conversation because then that sort of builds up that wall between design and code that's, that yeah. I find unappealing. Uh, Jeff asks, well, he's asking for a coworker. <laughs> Um, our design system team is small and the product design team is growing. How can we get them invested in contributing to the design system? Uh, that is a uh, eight layered question that or <laughs> the answer is really layered and, and hard. I did research over the last uh, six months, really predominantly in the fall with both members of the design system community and the clients I was working on. I uh, did probably 30 interviews and I came out of that hoping I'd be able to write a lot about here are the answers I'm hearing. And the reality is everybody's challenged by contributions. Mm -hmm. When you have a core group that's maintaining a system, how do you engage everybody else? Some of the things that um, I've come to believe are it's really difficult for contributors to come into a place that's unfamiliar. Um, and so you have to be empathetic to the fact that your processes as at least in my experience, more robust than theirs, mm -hmm. has a, a lot more rigor and rules around how things need to be composed, and um, has a lot of steps that they're either unfamiliar with doing, like they've maybe never written a unit test, or they've never done an accessibility check that's really formal, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And they, they can feel that, that sort of additional rigor can feel hostile to them, or, or really intimidating. The, the second thing is that I often find design system teams have their own process. It's like a locked in operational workflow. We have five steps. Each of these steps has all these sub steps. We all know what the criteria is. We fluidly work together. And then they turn around and they say, okay, contributors, here's a completely different model of how we're supposed to work. Like let's classify things in different ways and let's make this weird sort of rich workflow that goes through all these other steps. And I'm like, why do you do it one way here and another way there? Really what you're doing is you're inviting them into what's most likely a sub-step of your process. And that's the third thing that I find really challenging is really contributors approach a system really passionate and excited to contribute the value that they have. And that value might be creating a design, that value might be writing some documentation, that value might be coding up a component. But those are all steps of delivering a component feature. And so more often than not, they might be coming and able to do less. They can't do all the steps, they do one step. And so how are you going to help them deliver on the promise of the feature with all those other things that still have to get done? Right. So that, that's a challenge to think about. That's awesome. Um, 
ooh, this, <laughs> everybody's getting really like into the technical. I love it. Uh, Brian asks, what drawbacks are there to a system that is front end framework agnostic, in other words, supports Angular, Vue, React, specifically for a large company? Um, I am not the best person to answer that. Uh, I fashion myself as a first developer who became a designer mm -hmm. quite some years ago and now serves more often in a product manager and leadership role. And so there are a lot of technical challenges that I am not the most adept to describe. But I will say the two things that I hear a lot are, uh, first, data binding, sort of creating the relationship between the component that might be in one kind of language or framework and the environment that might be in another one. And how does it exchange data and events and all those other things that go because it's not written in the same way. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is just implementation. People come into uh, an adopter, sees a kit of parts they want to use, but suddenly the kit of parts is a whole new way model of thinking. They can learn it, they can experiment. And so how are you going to create test apps? How are you going to create command line tools? How are you going to really orient the features that you have to snugly fit in the way that they do work and, and provide a glimpse of how it all fits together? Um, and so that I see teams succeeding the best when they're thinking about that interchange and modeling their stuff in the environment of the people that are going to use it. Yeah. I think that's a big reason, um, you know, at Salesforce, they call them component blueprints because they're um, decoupled from Angular, right. Vue, React. Um, and that was intentional because like you said, there, there's all these things that you would want in place like testing and stuff and to be able to support that for all these different frameworks. I don't think we would have been able to ship at the rate we were shipping if we had to do that. Um, there were other teams at Salesforce that, um, you know, like there was, um, a team that was like writing like the React version of it. And then I believe it was on the marketing cloud side. They were wanting to do like, and then an Angular version and this version and that version. And there's at least five at Salesforce. Yeah. And name them all. What, what, you're, what you're always going to find is those are always going to be behind. Like there's always going to be catch up work. And um, personally, I just, I just think it's too much work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And I know teams are attempting it. Like I talked to, the carbon team at IBM and they were talking about doing the same thing. And I was just like, are you sure? <laughs> Cause it's a lot of work. <laughs> well, I think it is a lot of work. And I think if you're able to have the staff and you have the working models operationally to make it happen, that redundantly producing coded components across a range of frameworks, that's not a bridge too far, mm -hmm. but it's a tough one. And the, the other thing that comes to mind is, um, I don't think about just what, what's the cost to make this stuff. I think about the cost to maintain this stuff as a maker of a system, like the maintenance cost, particularly if you start having this dispersion of platforms, it, it's difficult. But then you also have to think about the cost of them moving to stuff, all the people that are adopting. And that cost is often an order of magnitude bigger than whatever the system team's going to bear. But it's a, a cost that the organization bears. And so you have to get pretty strategic around those investments to make sure you're doing the right thing. Right. Uh, Jeff asks, have you seen any tools that automate tokens generated using Theo being imported in Figma? No, because I'm not an expert there. I, <laughs> uh, it's, it's so interesting, the tokens conversation, and I'll just share a little bit of our journey. Um, myself, Kevin, and other members of our team, we, for four or five years, have just built our own custom tooling. And uh, like with many other tools in the design system space, Storybook's another one that's turning a lot of heads. Um, we got to the point this year where we're like, we need to stop doing this ourselves. We need to start using a tool that, that does this a lot better than we can. And we looked at both Theo and Style Dictionary. They're both great. Um, and, and we just found that for us, Style Dictionary spoke our language better, like sort of accorded to the models that we think about stuff. But we haven't yet started to dig into the reality of, of really threading in more than, quote unquote, just the styles, just the variables. Um, uh, in it into a, a single path like what I see teams often doing is is incorporating them but the depth of things that move from the design tokens to Figma is fairly shallow so I'm I, I like the connectedness but it feels almost like a proof of concept rather than a really strong threading but maybe I haven't seen what other teams have done really well yeah I my personal take on it is um, until they're doing some sort of you know coded component type design tool 
um, you can only really go so far, like colors maybe, font sizes maybe. Kind of, I mean, I'm pretty sure that's pretty similar to why DSM from Envision has a very limited set of tokens because sure. um, if you're not doing components, then it's hard to really apply the rest of the set. <laughs> And one of the things that I almost find challenging is how do you account for, like we were talking about before, the mix in, the functional or module like layer that you get from SAS into design tools? Because there's such richer power in that. And if you're just going to flow tokens, it's going to overwhelm it with just such long labeled, massive lists of choices, which almost defeats the purpose or becomes too hard to use. Yeah. Uh, Ryan asks, do you have much experience managing a design system whose audience is both for products and marketing? Um, let's stop there and then I'll ask the second one after that. <laughs> yes, and I am uh, demonstrably less happy in those conditions. <laughs> uh, it's, it's difficult because uh, I'm going to uh, broad brush generalizations here. But the the ecosystems of those two groups are often very much at odds or different that create forces that um, trigger the system to behave in ways that are in conflict. You know, products evolve gradually over time, incrementally, and they don't all typically evolve at the same time. Um, and so what you see, if it's, there's like a Gantt chart visualization of all the product work, you have all these bars that are interchanged, like when the, each of those products are actually adopting a particular generation like think every year or two generation of the design system. Mm -hmm. And that's natural and healthy with marketing orgs. And I won't name names here, but it's like every nine months, somebody gets a bee in their bonnet and they're going to have to redesign the whole thing. And so what that triggers teams to do is often throw out the kitchen sink and just start from scratch. Mm -hmm. And so the reinvention instinct often in marketing sites that I see feels in conflict. The other one is the dispersion or the scale. Like marketing sites tend to have a, a more well-contained set of groups. It's a smaller ecosystem to solve for, whereas product is larger and more diverse. And so that, that creates uh, seemingly opportunities for marketing, but also a, a lot narrower constraints and opinionatedness and even resistance to sharing ideas with product. I'll finish with the story to say, like one time I went in, I was hired by the product group and they were like, part of what we'd like to do strategically is build a stronger rapport with marketing so that we can really do a one system for all. And we had a conversation as the system was maturing, uh, the strategy had taken shape and we were starting to design and build things with the marketing side. And they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa that button's red. Or I'm sorry, that button's blue. And we were like, uh-huh. They said, our button's red. And we said, oh. And it wasn't that they didn't have validity, it, because they did. The red cell sold better. They proved it in studies over two years. They were completely resistant to any other color because it cost them 2% of their lift and conversion rate. Okay, I get that. And, but the, the challenge was that immediately turned off everybody in marketing such that they didn't want to have the conversation. And so my reaction was almost as if, so you're going to give up 4,999 other features because the color attribute of the primary button is wrong. They said, and it gets sort of triggered them to think, oh, there's more than just the color of the button. And yes, we have the autonomy to, to mold this in a way that makes our particular area of the experience, marketing, achieve the destiny we need. Mm -hmm. And so that, that becomes the challenge that I try to lead teams through. Cool. Uh, the second part of the question is, do you have a common core of styles such as colors and then branch out from there into too many systems that have their own unique components and styles? Uh, that gets at aspects of theming to me, uh, or I hear the, the challenge of theming. And there's a few different models that we see. One is uh, there's just one brand, there's one brand identity, one visual identity, and you just encode it in everything and nobody's even having the conversation. The second is you have really a master or default brand. This is when I was working with Marriott from 2012 to 15 when they went through their responsive conversion. That's where we sort of snuck in a design system as an as a enabling facet mm -hmm. of that program. And so there was a default brand that is sort of the Marriott.com. And then as you went into certain areas of the experience, you had a sub brand like a courtyard or a JW Marriott, where actually you end up seeing a mixture of the visual identity of the master and the, uh, the sub brand. Mm -hmm. The third one, we worked for um, a pharmaceutical company a year ago, 
and really they have very tight regulations on how they promote each of their pharmaceuticals. And uh, that comes all the way down to the component library needs that they have and layout templates that they have. And so there really was never any default brand. It was essentially a Mad Libs cheat sheet, fill out what your brand is and here's how we're gonna crank that visual identity into this set of templates. And so there, there was really no default. And so when we think about that from a tokens perspective, because that's where the sort of enabling tools kind of start, is are you gonna have a default set that you override with the sub-brand that you can extend and override with the sub-brand or you have a blank uh, set of tokens that you always need to fill out from the ground up. But uh, having those conversations like that helps the team, most teams I work with realize, oh, we don't need a theming system, that's really complicated. Um, and they, I've seen teams almost back up to make sure that the core works well before they start branching out into theming. Um, cool. So the next question, um, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Joao. Um, what are the main metrics of a design system and how to measure them? So that is a difficult question. One of the, as we think about measuring the effectiveness of the design system, um, you have to think about what are your goals. Uh, mm -hmm. And typically the goals of a design system are varyingly efficiency, speed to market, uh, consistency or uh, cohesiveness of the experience and uh, some forms of quality accessibility might be one of the attributes of quality that the team is trying to measure and so uh, I think about uh, sort of all those things also in just in terms of the utilization of the system itself how many teams are using it mm -hmm. how many teams are using each of the features often each component how old is each team's use of each component what is the rate of change of them upgrading to new components? And so you think about how, what are the core things that people use, the tools, and frankly, it's packages of code and design assets, and to a lesser extent, documentation site. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how are you gonna track whether or not they're getting used and whether or not they're being successfully used? Uh, and so I see teams doing things that are uh, already embedded in package registries like Artifactory um, to, to measure the package use. Mm -hmm. or building uh, manual tools that actually scan repositories and look for uh, code uh, and look for sort of the hooks of a component name or whatever other property they can really isolate the use of a component. Those are tough to do well because of how repositories are built and I'm working with a team now where it's, its adoption is really starting to seep in but they're like we had 3,000 new component uses this week and I'm thinking did one team just render 300 templates and you know how are those distorted? but really helping see the trends and the aging and the rate of change of things are, are, are good. I also see um, teams measuring sentiment around mm -hmm. use of the system and value that the system has in its workflow that um, if I think as a statistician, like that's my education in statistics, I think about longitudinally, how are people's attitudes changing? How are they feeling about the system and where it needs to go? Um, and you can measure those things just, um, both quantitatively and qualitatively to get a good sense of the success or not of your system. So those are some things that come to mind. Um, the last thing I'll say is uh, we just measure how much we're making and how fast we're making it. And so uh, are we delivering at a pace that is meeting the demand of the customers? And um, are we delivering at a pace that's consistent? And so we'll ask those questions of our own core team. Cool. Um... I feel like that's like probably one of the most common questions that come up. And one of um, one of the projects I was working on recently, the client asked, you know, how do we track the usage? And usage is a very difficult thing to track. Um, one thing I was playing around with as an idea, but I haven't done like a proof of concept or anything yet, is you know, could design tokens be used in some sort of tracking way? I don't know. <laughs> so just sort of an idea that I want to play with at some point. <laughs> I think certainly like we look to detect component usage, which is mm -hmm. for better or worse, the primary object people use from a system. Yeah. Um, I'm a huge advocate of lower level tooling that enable people to build their own stuff using tokens and whatever mm -hmm. utilities and that the system provides. And so, yeah, measuring that stuff makes a lot of sense. Another thing actually I forgot to mention was coverage tools as well. Right. I'm really, uh, it's always so encouraging to see a design system team build some JavaScript based tool that in the browser, it overlays all the things that came from the system. Morningstar's coverage tool actually produces a second web page that has a report of all the different types and quantifies each of the specific components that are used. 
And once you start to do that, you invite people into thinking about coverage, which is sort of the proportion of the real estate in a, a viewport, for example, mm -hmm. covered by the system versus not, as a way to think about the role of the system and, and how much it's being used. And really, also the ceiling of how much it's going to be used, because you're going to continue to have to make your own stuff cover part of the page yourself. Right. So Cool. Uh, Brian asks, um, my company has acquired a few companies that still have their own development environments and we're trying to consolidate design systems. I'm not convinced that anyone has thought through how we'll provide high quality developer tools to engineers and environments that have different architecture, non-DS tooling, etc. Have you seen anyone do this successfully? Uh, consolidating is hard. Mm -hmm. um, have I seen people consolidate systems successfully? Yes. Um, and it may not be the kind of consolidation you'd expect. So if you imagine that there are organizational units A through E, or mm -hmm. you have sort of A is your default company and B through E are your acquisitions. Uh, when you're consolidating, you have to ask yourself the question, what are we starting from? And what are we going to rationalize to? And who is going to rationalize? Where is the value in that? And so sometimes an outcome is let's choose A's and B through E are going to migrate to A's and A is going to have to evolve to meet the needs of B through E. And so even those sort of broad class of characterizations, that involves a lot of work of all those things to, to get at all those things. Another outcome is actually we have A through E and we realize that to move forward, we want to do Z. And so we need to create Z and Z needs to meet the needs of everybody. So everybody's migrating. Um, and in that case, you're more likely to serve the needs of, of many different frameworks if you can achieve it. But that also then raises the question of actually E doesn't matter and C doesn't matter. And mm -hmm. so the, the consolidation I've seen successful is they, have an, they had an A, B and C for lines of business. They always want to, everybody wants to get through A to C, but uh, they built A in 2018 they uh, consolidated B and A together in 2019. And now in 2020, they're still rolling out A, B, and they haven't yet been able to trigger the incorporation of C. And so the things take time and they, they happen more incrementally. But uh, a lot of my consulting these days is this, I'm about to start a project this quarter and next quarter, each that are asking the question, should we consolidate? If so, how, and what are our objectives of doing so? Yeah, when at Salesforce, we would track the different acquisitions and, you know, who was adopting and who wasn't. And sometimes it was just the font. You know, I think like with Quip, like when Quip was acquired, they, I think they only changed the font. <laughs> and for us, that was still a win. <laughs> yeah, I, and it, yeah. these things can be incremental or gradual over time, too. You know, I think about Atlassian. They've acquired a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. Trello came in with a kick kicking design system. Why would you tell? That's like a, a core part of maybe how they're so valuable and good. You wouldn't say, well, we've got Atlas, kid. Guess what? Time to transform. You have no choice. That's nachos, not good. Nachos, right? I think it's not called good. nachos. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I mean, in the long arc, yeah, there's a conversation to be had. But yeah. in the short term, it, you, it's not just a, a just fait accompli. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan asks, what are the minimum resources to incorporate the design system methodology into a mid-sized organization? And how would you outline such process? That's difficult to answer straight because there's so many dimensions to think about. Mm -hmm. um, but things that I would think about is I'd want to start where are you at today? Like what is your investment in different uh, aspects of your system and like how many people are doing it, what kind of results are you achieving and where do you want to go? What do you want to achieve in the future? Do you want to build a really gorgeous documentation site because you have the scale that requires it? Do you want to start building for a framework and expand your library from 25 to 50 components? You know, there, there are all these different questions and you have to think about where do we want to get to in order to answer those questions. Uh, I do see that um, growth is almost always consistent with what is your investment level? And when you're talking about investment level, how many people, what capacity is your team? And so thinking about the, the stages of growth from a team from people doing it on nights and weekends to a second step being uh, interdependent, but not necessarily a, a squad like group of people that are making a system. The third stage is you've got 
maybe three or four people creating a team. And then that grows to like eight or 10 people. And oftentimes that's big enough or you're like Salesforce or Atlassian or Google or whatever. And you start having teams of teams, you know, what, how are you going to characterize that arc of growth? Where are you on that arc and where you want to get consistent with the, the outcomes you want to achieve? Uh, th those are the questions I would ask. Cool. Kayleigh, hey Kayleigh, uh, how uh -oh. might a design, huh? Oh. <laughs> Someone who knows way more than I do is gonna ask a question. Um, how might a design system welcome contributions really easily while not systemizing, oh, sorry, systematizing mediocrity? I'd want them to tell me more about what do you mean by mediocrity? Mm -hmm. Like it, that almost positions the contributor in a role of no, that they're not as good as the people on the design system team. You know, like what what makes a contributor not good enough to produce as good a quality stuff as people on the system team, other than their familiarity and experience with the tools and the expectations. Mm -hmm. And so, like I was talking about before, and actually Shopify is pretty good contributor docs. Uh, and I know both on the design and the dev side, they think about this and they care a lot about the people that are contributing and they, they treat them with, they accord them a lot of respect. Um, but what can happen is, uh, I, I think mediocrity can be um, sort of a dumbing down of, of what you have in your system because there's not a cohesive vision of where it's going. There's not a, a sort of strong interplay between all the different people working on all the different parts. Mm -hmm. And if you have all these disconnected people working on disconnected parts, in order for it to go into a place, it probably would have to be fairly vanilla. And yeah. so I'd wonder to what extent you, uh, I would look between sort of this, um, all these different federated contributors and a core team that knows everything. And how are you going to establish perhaps a middle ring of that where you have extend an extended team group of designers or engineers that are fostering healthy cultures of critique, stronger visibility across the enterprise around where everyone's going towards this Polaris kind of target and, and, and how can you lift everyone as a result so that a contributor a little bit more distant starts small, fixes a defect, builds an enhancement, and eventually maybe a year from now is thinking about deep content guidelines or something that is far more robust that the system can make. Cool. Um, our final question comes from Todd. Uh, being the only person on the small company I work for, one back-end dev plus two stakeholders, and none are interested in collaboration, but I've been given the green light to go ahead and do what I need in our rebuilding website and app, what would you say to people that are doing this alone and how daunting it seems to create a design system? Uh, a few things. The first is there's nothing like... Uh, trending towards a design system by just designing and building systematically. And so as you think about breaking down your work, decomposing it into the parts, the components, the variations, the states that you need to really depict, how do those help you just deliver high quality stuff? How does that help you form a relationship with a developer that maybe now has you saying the exact same words and using the exact same language, but you start to develop a rapport that's stronger and you start to see the models that you're creating as a designer in the work that they're creating as a developer. Mm -hmm. And that system takes time and can, frankly, in a team of one designer and developer, take months or a year to really develop uh, naturally over time. And that may signal the opportunities to say, what should we reuse? What should we focus on more? like buttons or form inputs or whatever, and what should we focus on less? That big sort of marketing ad in the upper left corner that our stakeholder seems to want to iterate every single day. Mm -hmm. um, and so once you start thinking about that and you start understanding the value of what you're recreating over time, uh, that, that is where I would start. How can you have, take a systems mindset? The other thing I would say is don't look at all the glossy, beautiful design systems out there as your goal, because that is not your goal. Yeah. You are not trying to become material. You're not trying to become Shopify Polaris or Carbon or whatever. Seek inspiration from those. Uh, look for quality and like, qualities in each of those. But make what you need to be successful. Mm -hmm. And that probably doesn't mean a documentation site. It doesn't mean some big sketch library that you have to force yourself to be a customer of. Instead, all your crap's in one file. It's fairly well organized, but it's facilitating a system of discussion with your developer. And that's the key. Yeah, um, when the first team I was on at Salesforce actually was not 
the Lightning team. It was a smaller product called Do. And I was having to build these things anyway. So I was like, well, I don't want to build that button over and over and over again. So I'm going to go ahead and build it in a way that's reusable and modular. And sometimes my, my colleagues would ask me why I would spend the time doing that. And I'm just like, well, do you want to rebuild this thing over and over again? I don't think so. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, like, I definitely wasn't building out a full-fledged website, but I was just doing you know, what I could to make it reusable. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, that's the end of the questions. Um, is there any other like wisdom you want to impart before we, we end the, um, the Q and A? <laughs> uh, don't forget about the outcome you're trying to create. And so I'm, I'm, I'm in a, uh, like all projects are challenging, but I, I'm with a team now going through sort of a, a drive to launch the latest generation of their stuff and it's hard and there's a deadline and like you're doing all this work but it was really great this morning when the design lead brought in in order to like test upgrading the system from one generation to another she went out and she gathered all these materials from mm -hmm. existing sketch files that all these teams had and it was just to do testing but as it turns out I was like oh you totally need to show this in our stand-up and then we had a working session afterwards give us a rogues gallery tour because then everyone's seeing oh my gosh, they're using all our stuff. Oh, we have value. And the value isn't like publishing your components on a doc site and a sketch library. The value is when you see all the other teams using it and those things making their way into production. Yeah. And so don't forget to celebrate those moments. Look for those moments and keep the connection between your system and all the people that use it really strong rather than decoupled and distant. Cool. And then my last question for you is, is there anything coming up for you we should look out for or ways we can support you? Um, as a community. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Keep reading the Medium posts. I find, <laughs> uh, I, I find a lot of joy out of writing in Medium. And it is actually my productivity on Medium is uh, consistent with the energy or lack thereof I'm feeling on certain projects. So if you keep the energy high and we uh, keep sharing like I try to and other people do as well, that, that gives me a lot of energy. It's a great feeling to be a part of a community that's sharing a lot of ideas. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nathan. Yep. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. Yeah, and so this will end up on YouTube and like I said, design systems at eventbrite.com to see the future ones coming up. Um, and thank you so much everyone for joining us. <laughs>